Welcome to another edition of the Big Head Pod here on the Dub Network. Our show today is brought to you by Herman Marshall Whiskey. Dallas County's first distillery handcrafted award-winning small batch whiskey, patiently aged in new white oak barrels in the great state of Texas. Built from the ground up like good whiskey and better friends should be. Guys, they're opening a new facility in Wiley here in the springtime with an outdoor venue. Uh, I'm looking forward to it. They've got a rye, they've got a blend, and they've got a bourbon. So if you guys get a chance to check it out, go ahead and do it. And they're, uh, they said a small batch. This stuff is is really good, especially just straight for you. So you guys to look into that as well. And also by Early Bird CBD. This stuff helps me sleep at night, helps my joints, my aching joints from how old my body feels from playing. It's Baseball's taking a tear on my body and everything else. So you just try and find ways. This Early Bird CBD kind of helps, helps me sleep at night. So you can check it out, earlybirdcbd.com. And uh, use the code BIGHEADPOD to get 20% off your first order. And uh, check that out, guys, so you get a chance. So I'd like to introduce my next guest. He played up in Canada for a while playing baseball, living here in the great state of Texas. He's got an interesting story as well to tell. Good buddy of mine, Mr. Ellis Valentine. Ellis, how are you today, sir? Good, Kevin. You? I'm doing good. Good. I'm doing good. We were... When you got in here, we started talking about just our body, the wear and tear that we've been through. And gosh, he said, some days we feel 20. Most of the time we feel probably 20 years older than our actual age. I haven't so. felt 20 in a while. Yeah. <laughs> it's right. been a minute. Right. <laughs> we don't think about it when we're playing, no, do we? I mean, you know, our our bodies took so much roadkill, man. You know, I mean, just, just running over us and just beating us up. And now we're just suffering from it to a degree. But we're doing the best we can to try to keep it going. And you were talking about the turf that yes. you played in Montreal yes. when they first opened Olympic Stadium, correct? Yes. This was what year? 1976. So they didn't know anything about AstroTurf back then other than... Well, they knew about AstroTurf, but they didn't know how it was going to affect the body. The way, you know, these players, you know, these, these, uh, these organizations built these stadiums with this turf because it was cost-effective. It makes sense. It was nice. It was state-of-the-art then, but... It was hard on our phys- uh, on us physically, yeah. right? The ball bounce off of that stuff twenty feet in the air. Well, there's different different uh, stadiums. Uh, Minnesota was probably the worst in terms of the ball bouncing, uh, having an actual bounce effect. Yeah. Uh, so you had to learn each one. They, you know, they had dead spots, they had wrinkle spots, they had seams, they had all kinds of different. You uh, so so you played in Olympic Stadium when they first opened. Did you also play? What was the old ballpark they played in? Terry Park. Where was it located? I've never been uh, to Montreal. Kind of north, north. Uh, I, I kind of get turned around, but north of Montreal uh, City downtown, kind of up from there a little bit. Uh, kind of a little community ballpark, and they just turned it into a major league field, and they started playing some baseball there. So it was. Kind of so it was one of those that just retrofit four yeah, baseball. Yeah, pretty much like of, Texas was too. Okay, you know, to a type of thing. I got yeah. you. So growing up, you're from is it Arkansas? Yes. And then I was reading up on a little bit, and then moved to California. Yeah, that's three. So I don't yep. know much about Arkansas. Didn't I? Okay. <laughs> so you end up, in, up in California. Yeah. yeah. So you yeah. end up in California, and uh, yes. kind of explain what what where you went from there as far as your baseball career. Were you just a baseball? Were you just an at, just baseball in general? Did you do? Something else. Any other sports, did you? Yeah, I played everything. Football was uh, big in high school. Played uh, two years varsity. Couldn't play my first, my third year because I broke my leg in my uh, junior, between my junior and senior year in high school playing baseball out at Blair Field in Long Beach. I broke my leg in uh, two places. Um, so uh, they had to put a pin in my leg and da da da. So I didn't play varsity football that year. I would have let her three years in a row. Um, and I did play varsity baseball that year, but I was a pitcher and uh, first baseman, everything, everything else. Okay, but I didn't play everything but catch. I never, I never caught. So uh, that's what happened. How'd you end up breaking your leg? Sliding in the second base, trying to break up a double play. Uh, the guy planted. As soon as he planted, I did a little hook slide and tried to pull his leg out from under, but he planted and boom, right around his his. Uh, his ankle and mine. You sell yeah. the pen in there now? The no, 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 no. They, they, took, took uh, they took the pen out two years later. To the... And uh, my second year in minor leagues. And um, uh, I had a little limp from there. 
it was pretty fast. You know, I could run a little bit. Um, but that slowed me down a little bit, but, you know, I got caught up. But Montreal drafted me as a pitcher and first baseman. I never played first and never pitched. They put me in right field because I had to pin in my leg. They didn't want any contact. Yeah. So that's where they discovered my outfield arm. What, so you, I was reading up on this outfield arm. Well, what did you do as a kid just to – you just throwing everything you could, or was it just a matter of, you know, everybody always th- thinks they have the right way to go. You know, you see this stuff on, on TV mm-hmm. and, and these images, these gurus, hey, do this. You're going to, you know, see guys running down hills, learning velocity wise. What, what were you doing or what, what kind of separated you and made and helped you with the arm strength and everything else? Well, the arm strength that I use is generated from my feet. Yeah. It's not generated from my arm. The arm is the last act yeah. of the throw. Uh, so you have to get the body involved, and uh, footwork is what's uh, paramount. I don't see that today in baseball. You know, they're not using that philosophy, or they're not even trying to incorporate it today. So growing up, throwing, you know, baseballs, rocks, you name it, here and there in the neighborhood, the neighbors got together with my mom. And my mother was a beautician. And they told my mom, they said, look, I'm tired of your son breaking on windows around here, <laughs> you know, and tearing up our cars and stuff. So why don't we get him involved in uh, organized baseball? I was seven at the time, but I was big as every ninth grade, ninth, nine-year-old. Yeah. Because back in the day, you had to be nine to play Little League. Okay. Yep. You know, yep. T-ball wasn't happening back then. Yep. So they doctored up my birth certificate, <laughs> and I went out there and I started playing. And uh, actually... You know, let me, let me back up and let me tell you the story. That the guy that they sent over to my house, a guy named Grover Strickland, okay, came to my house, had a glove for me and a ball, and he had heard about me from the other beauticians at my mother's uh, beauty shop. Yeah. And he said, I just wanted to play catch with your son. So he gave me the ball, gave me the glove. I threw two balls to him. He came, he got the glove for me, he told my mom, he said, have your boy at my park tomorrow at 2 o'clock. That was it. That was South Park, 19, that was back in the, oh, let's see, that had to be middle 60s. And you hadn't played baseball up to this point at all? Uh, no, just because they didn't have just football? Yeah. Or just messing no, around? Just, just playing around the neighborhood. Sandlot stuff and everything else? Playing around with my cousins and all the neighbors and the kids. You know, we lived in the projects, across the street from the projects. Uh, we moved from across the street. Uh, into a little home, and that was really cool. And my mom had a beauty shop right around the corner, and that's how that all got started. And that was on the east side of Los Angeles. You get so you get drafted right out of out of high school, and you're what, what round? Second round? Second round. Second round. Yes. And where did they send you for your rookie ball? Uh, they sent me to Cocoa Beach for rookie ball, but they sent me to Jamestown, New York first. Okay, okay. they had a upper level class A ball team there or whatever you want to call it and they sent me there first and uh the couple of days i stayed there it was very different as far as it was just different because i grew up in south central los angeles i grew around all black folks yeah (laughs) (laughs) there was one you couldn't there was no none (laughs) for i tell you this story (laughs) john McHale jr drove me from the airport Two hours to Jamestown, New York. And let me tell you, Kevin, Jamestown, New York was different. Uh, it was a little community town where you see this, you know, these kind of movies that you see, you know, with uh, Kevin Cosner and all that, you know. Yep. You know. So uh, there's this baseball field in the middle of this neighborhood. This neighborhood had houses all the way around the neighborhood, okay? And there's, there's this big dormitory there sitting in these houses and this ball field. And on the corner, there was a little store, you know, with a pickle jar on yeah. the counter and the cookies and all that stuff and the glass. So we go in there, and, you know, after two days, I had not seen a black person for two days. Serious. I'm, I'm not just saying this being, And you're you know, 18 at this time. Opposite. Yeah, I'm no, 18. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I haven't seen it. Yeah. No, I'm 17. 17. I hadn't turned 18 yet. Okay. I just graduated. Gotcha. Turned 18 July 30th. Oh, uh, graduated in June, late part of June. But um, so I'm kind of culture shocked a little. Okay, it's not like I'm afraid of anything. I just it's just different. 
So I go into this little store and I see this black dude in the back. We're in the back. He had a pool hall, pool table back there. One pool table. We didn't put in a quarter, you know, small yeah. pool table. So I run back there and I'm excited to see the dude the dude's from Puerto Rico. He doesn't <laughs> speak a word of English. <laughs> <laughs> Kevin, this is my first time seeing a dark-skinned Puerto Rican or Hispanic type. Yep. You follow me? Because yep. I'm in California. Yep. We don't see that. We don't see people like from Florida, you know, coming from over yep. in New York or whatever. So we don't see that. We didn't see it. Freaked me out. <laughs> <laughs> I was gone, dude. I said, look, I'm out of here. I went back to the dorm. They took me out of... Uh, Jamestown two days later and shipped me to Cocoa Beach. And uh, that's where we shared the field with the Houston Astros in rookie ball. And we played in the Montreal Expos played there and, and Houston played there as well. And that's where I played rookie ball. They, didn't, they never told you why they pulled you out? Why they even sent no, you for they, two days? No, they, they wanted me to be inspired by these guys that was there. Ah, uh, okay, I got you. In Jamestown, okay, okay because uh, Coco hadn't started yet. I got you. See, they hadn't... And, Got everybody there. Is yeah. that what they were told you and going, hey, we're going to yeah, take you we here just for two days? You, yeah. They didn't give you a heads up. Hey, no, no, you're no, probably not going to see another up. black person or no, something. No, it wasn't. <laughs> no, just, right? It, was, just, it wasn't about them. Yeah. This was about me. Yeah. You feel me? Yeah. And, and I had to deal with that because that was my, <laughs> that wasn't my world. Yeah. You see what I'm saying? So I had to learn that. And so that's what happened. <laughs> that's what, but you're right, though. I mean, it, you, you would have figured a little bit of, hey, just a heads up. You're not going to, because right where you growing up in, in, in South Central, right? That's, it's all it's black dark, people. Yeah. yeah it's right. For the majority. I mean, yes. occasionally. And then all of a sudden. Yeah. We right, had it, one Hispanic dude at our school. Yeah. Okay. And I graduated high school. Yeah. So that tells you a lot. So. Yeah. So you go down there, so you go down to, down to Cocoa Beach and you're, and you're there. Right. And so now you have, you've, you know, you got Latin players, black players, white yes. players and everything else. So now you're, you're. 18, 17 still, right? Sure. These are still younger guys. Yes. Are you still in shock being down here with these guys that are, you know, that maybe have been there? Or I mean, I'm, how the draft was set up back then, the amount of rounds, I don't know how they were. No, no, no. It was, we were all the same. Everybody was green. Gary Carter yeah. and I, Gary was number two draft. I was, uh, Jerry, I was number two draft. Gary Carter was number three. Okay. And mm -hmm. Bobby Goodman was the number one draft out of Memphis, Tennessee. And uh, so, you know, out of that draft, uh, Gary and I made it to the big leagues, you know, the two of us. Goodman just ran into a, a ton of buzzards luck, man. I'm telling you, it was just bad. Just just injured and financial challenges and all kinds of stuff. But this dude was unbelievable, Kev. He could hit a – he was a right-hand hitter, and he could hit a ball out of the right field line just like a left-handed pull hitter. Really? Yow. Just never got that opportunity. Just like you said, just derailed too many. Kept getting hurt. Yeah. If – you, he would be kind of like you know if if Tony Romo hadn't got hurt, we probably wouldn't have heard much about Dak. Yeah, you feel me? Yep. That gotcha. situation, and so got gotcha. you. That's so what you, happens. You're it playing was, Cocoa Beach with with future Hall of Famer Gary Carter, and you're you're going up your first year of pro ball. Where'd you go? Full season. West Palm Beach. Not a bad place a to ball. be. A ball. A ball. First year. First full year. We're actually, the two years out of uh, two months. After, you know, high school, you know, June, July, and August played there. And then I went and played winter ball in uh, Sarasota um, with the Expos. And we played against, you know, a whole bunch of teams down there in winter ball instructional league. And then uh, West Palm Beach the next year, first year, A ball. Great place to play, though. Florida State League? It was great. It was awesome. Lived down on Singer Island. It was awesome. Larry Parrish was on the team with me. Carter, a few of the other guys. Carter got pulled up earlier because we needed, they needed catchers. But... We went on to win that and play well. So did you go back home after your first year of pro ball? You went back to California and then uh, every year we go back. To every year go back. To, yeah. So then you played West Palm. Then what? Double A was Quebec City, up in Mon uh, up yeah. above Montreal. Yeah. Yeah, that was Double A. Uh, mm -hmm. So here's another culture shock. You're going oh, to boy. Kill. You're going. <laughs> but it was beautiful. It was the most, <clears throat> I guess, rewarding minor league. Um, I guess family, yeah. you know, with the Expos because we're so close to Montreal. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? And so they had that energy from there. But uh, it kind of gave us that little leg up on the horse from being in Montreal and kind of know what the cold was like because I'd never been in snow, you know, and all that. <laughs> all this stuff was very new to me. 
So uh, I had to wake up to it. Mm -hmm. And played up there, and then you get to the big leagues the next year or that no, year? No, went to uh, Memphis. Okay. Triple A in Memphis. Uh, played with the uh, uh, Memphis team. Carl Keel was the manager. Larry Doby was one of our assistant batting coaches. And uh, we, had, we had some good guys. Uh, you know, I got through that season um, with a whole bunch of numbers. Uh, myself and Willie Randolph, we really showed off in that. Uh, he was with the Pirates then. We just kind of showed out in that league that year. If it wasn't him leading the category, it was me. So we just kind of dominated that, that that year. Go to spring training and earn your next year, earn a spot in the, on the big club. And that was '75. Um, big club broke camp with them in '76, uh, and then they sent me out two months into the assignment. I don't know, they sent me out two months uh, my first year, my first full year which kind of knocked me out of the running for the uh, rookie of the year thing. Yeah. You know what I mean? And uh, then that was real devastating. It was, it was really tough because I didn't get my shot, but I, I was in the running. How old were you at that time? Oh, uh, yeah, what was I, 21? Yeah, I forget. What you're still young. I mean, you're still young. Still a baby. Still, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, you're still a baby yeah. doing this, right? Still mm -hmm. 20, 20 years. 20 years old, 20 silly, years old. right? And didn't, didn't, didn't what else to expect yes. uh, as far as playing wise. Well, you know, I'm grateful that I can go to Montreal because there was nobody there. There was nobody that had to go beat out a position for or whatever. All I had to do was show up, and I did. And I showed up well. But what happened that second, that, that, that first full year, why I didn't get the full year, the rookie of the year thing, you know, I just didn't get it. But went down to Denver, stayed there for a couple of months, came back, did okay. But I didn't, didn't get the shot at the rookie of the year deal. So you ended up – Play in how many years in Montreal? Um, with that organization, eight. Eight, and then, and then what? Where'd you go from Montreal? I went to New York for a year and a half. I got traded. I was on DL when I got traded on the disabled list. I, was, I pulled a hamstring, but it was uh, it was uh, 1981. And it was after I had an injury. I got hit in the jaw in 1980, and uh, so my my value just changed as a player with the Expos. Uh, and they decided to get something before, for me before I became a free agent. Yeah. And so they did. They shipped me off to New York for Jeff Reardon and two other guys, Frank Tavares and Dan Norman. And um, I played there for a year and a half. And that was the year I played with – the first year I played with the – I saw the a picture of it. Yeah. helmet on there because I had gotten hit in the – and so Joe Torrey, you know, I was still a little leery because what had happened, you know, a lot of it <clears> – <throat> Kind of mimics the CTE type mm -hmm. because you're talking about head trauma. Head, yep. uh, I just couldn't get out of the way. Um, and so what a lot of guys are experiencing with CTE, with, with loss of vision, my peripheral vision was gone from here. So as a hitter, you know if, if our head is here yep. and we lose it from here to here and that breaking ball comes in, what do we do? Yep. Yanking out of the way because you yeah. don't see it. Yeah, I didn't see it. Yeah, and so what happened? They continued to put me in the lineup against right-handers, and I continued to battle it. Yep. Okay. One of the reasons they continued to put me in the lineup against right-handers because they wanted me to cover up for Kingman and for George Foster. That was a big money guy, so they needed somebody to hit behind them, so people would pitch to them. Mm -hmm. So that's was that was the role that I had. So I had lost that role in Montreal, where I was number three, four. Very, very rarely from number five in the lineup, but I was pretty much the number four hitter for a couple of years there. Yeah. And uh, so, you know, you, you, you pat it then. But um, go to New York, that that all changed. So, But that, that was due to the injury. Yeah, I'm sure. It's like Trying you said, it's not something. It. Yeah. I mean, remember Tony Canigliaro had the same type of thing, right? Yeah, he did. Yeah. And uh, also Dickey Thun. Yeah. Yeah, you know, we, we had some guys that, you know, some guys get hit and they, they, they come out of it. Now these guys are wearing face masks and, you know, full armor. Here. Yeah, it's full armor. Full wearing. armor, man. They go up to the plate. It's like, throw at me. Yeah, right. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> you exactly. know what I mean? But back then we had nothing. So Joe Torre, I'll get back to the story. Joe Torre encouraged me to take it off, he said, because it'll be a psychological thing. He couldn't have been no further from the truth. It wasn't a psychological thing. It was positive. It was a psychological thing negatively because 
I couldn't overcome that. It took me about three years to overcome that vision <coughs> deficit. You yep. follow me? Mm -hmm. Before, and so things got back right. Now I was very positive against left-hand hitters because the curveball's coming into me. Yeah. And I was, you know, I was here. But right-handers, I lost that. Yep. I lost that. So uh, I balanced out. You know, end up 280 life and lifetime batting average. I must have been pretty good before. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. because I struggled for a few years afterwards, not because I couldn't play. It was because of where I was located in the lineup. Yeah. And the pitches you were getting. Mm -hmm. So I had to accept that. So I prayed about it. Um, I prayed about it. After I got hit, I really didn't want to play anymore. Okay. Really, I was ready to, I was ready to retire. Just give it up. Uh, and I was encouraged. I said, you know, I got some financial things I need to take care of. I was taking care of family and this, this, that, and the other. So I prayed about it. And I asked the Lord, I said, hey, give me five more years of this. It was 1980, 81. I said, give me five more years, just five years, and I'm done. And I was going to put in five more years, and I was going to let it go. And within those five years, I kept running from injury to injury to injury to injury. And I just got so freaking frustrated with injury after injury after injury and rehab after rehab after. So uh, when the Rangers, I hadn't played with, uh, I, I went to a free agency with the uh, Angels in 83. I left the, uh, the Mets as a free agent and went 83 to the Angels. Um, the only reason I got that position was because of Bobby Clark went down. Um, and so I took that position there and, and I played there for a, a half a season. And let me tell you what happened. The first day of spring training, I tore my Achilles. I ripped my Achilles. Ouch. I ruptured it. <laughs> first day in Casa Grande, we had to do a lap around the you know, mm -hmm. whole thing. And my Achilles ruptured the first day. So I did not play for several months, started in like late May, June, and I ended up doing okay. Um, not not great. You can look back and see some of the numbers if you ever wanted to. But um, I was starting to see better. And I was starting to see more left-handers. Because when I was with New York, my year coming up as a free agent, I'm a right-handed hitter. Yeah. And they're platooning me with Joe Youngblood. Okay. Another right-handed right hitter. So when the left-handers was on the mound back then when I was becoming a free agent and I owned left-handers, I wasn't playing. Doesn't, you know? Yeah. You know, so, yeah. I did, so I'm sitting here and getting real frustrated and the whole works. So I went through a whole lot, but... You know, the 13 years of the, the career, you know, uh, a lot of it was injury-ridden. But I love baseball, man. I love the game. I, 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 it's, it was just a, a passionate uh, athletic movement, you know, when you're out there and just enjoying yourself and you can do what God blessed you with. But then, you know, when you have all these different ups and downs and challenges that come on, um, you know, it, it just kind of takes away from that, that joy. You're right because it's that's all you know, right? You knew that's all it was. Baseball. We all right. We have the identity we have is right. We're we're at we're baseball players. We talk about that's just that's what we do. And then right, and then all of a sudden it's taken from us. Be you know as far as the injury, um, all the time. Yeah, yeah it does that to us. Sure. So then you know right, and all of a sudden you just you got to stop. Now what do we do? Right, we we. We don't have an identity. We've, no. I've talked about this on the show before about guys. Even like same with the military, they come out of the military, they don't have an identity, right? No. And they've and it's it's hard. What you know, right? It's almost you almost get scared to a point because you don't know what to do, yeah. right? And so, what did you do once you once you stop? You retired in what year? Mm -hmm. What retired year? In, uh, 85. 85. Last year, so what was, that was the last contract. The, and so I, you know, I struggled with the first year of kind of you know getting back to. Just find out where am I at in life, right? Mm -hmm. you know, I had some real estate things going on in California and some investments and whatever, and so I decided to go back to California and because uh, I was well, I was in California anyway with the Angels, uh, but after the Rangers uh, called me uh, after not playing for two years of that uh, three-year contract with the Angels, 
Um, they called me and said, man, you got more talent in your little finger than most guys on our team having their entire body. I said, do you want to play again? I said, yes, I do. Uh, I said, well, <clears throat> why don't you get in shape? So I started playing around locally in the Los Angeles area with some of the guys I played with, uh, Babe Ruth League and stuff before, Ed Panic and a few other teams, and got myself in shape because I hadn't played in two years. Mm-hmm. And uh, so the Rangers asked me to come on down to AAA, um, play with Oklahoma City. I went down to AAA. Two weeks into the assignment, I tore the meniscus in my knee. <laughs> <laughs> so I wasn't going to just belly up on them. So I stayed there and I DH'd it out. And we ended up winning the division there. You know, I ended up hitting like 311, hit several home runs or whatever. Um, won some games, won some big games. We did okay, but I, just, I couldn't play defense like I was known to, mm-hmm. you know. And um, so I finished up with them. They brought me up to the big club and injuries continued to bother me. I couldn't play out in the right field the way I wanted to. So I hit a couple walk-off home runs for them, uh, ninth inning, that kind of thing. Da-da-da, we won some games. Uh, I played a couple of innings in the outfield, but I couldn't play very much. And I was grateful to their opportunity to get, let me play. Okay, just gave me a shot. Uh, John Young called me and said, Ellis, man, we just really want to give you a shot. And they really wanted me to start again. The Rangers weren't where they wanted to be at that time. Mm-hmm. And I still had some promise, but I couldn't keep my legs under me. And um, so after the season was over, they, um, they sent me an invite to spring training. Okay. I said, it's gotten to the point where they're inviting me to spring training. Yeah. <laughs> it's time to go home. <laughs> yeah. It's time to stay home. And so that was the first time I actually took the invite, and I uh, threw it on the dresser and said, I'm call it a day. And that was 80, 85. Um, the beginning of the 86 season, I didn't even want to go. So what? So you're how old this time? Yeah, 30-ish. So you still, I mean, yeah, right? Still a baby. Uh, yeah. But I just, I could not, you see, Andre Dawson, Larry Parrish, um, Gary Carter, most of these guys that was there with me played the whole time, a hard time, they all got knee replacements. Both knees. Replaced. Mm-hmm. My wife's an orthopedic nurse. She's retired now, but she told me, she said, don't do it unless you can't sleep, you can't sit without pain. She said, if you got some pain, you got some arthritis in your knee, Tolerate it, deal with it. Don't let them cut on you if you don't have to. So I'm staying away from that. But our needs got beat up in Montreal bad. And, and that, so when I went to Texas, oh, when I went to New York, that helped because it was on natural grass. So for the next few teams I played with, it was on natural grass, which helped. So, so you're out of out of baseball now. What's your What's your first thought then? As soon as you're done, I mean, what What is Ellis Valentine going to do at this moment? Is this at all that you've time, known? I didn't know what to do. Uh, I kind of went through some some uh, ups and downs just uh, personally. I, I challenged myself with a lot of drug use and, and just erratic behavior. And uh, I was doing some of that before. Uh, a lot because of it was of the just in- to medicate pain. Yeah, because Yeah, because of the injury. Yeah, and then yeah. you find out later on that you can, you know, it's, hey, you know, you can just hang out with this for a minute. But most of it was medicating injuries. I mean, you know, it's... You don't put those kinds of industrial strength chemicals in your body just for joy. Yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> you know, and you didn't I, know any different, right? You're, you're a young kid, and that's what no. they take this. This is what we. Everybody was doing things. Yeah, not. I'm just saying everybody. I'm just saying at that time, drug life was a little bit different than it is now. It is still prevalent now, but you know there was a big upswing. Mm-hmm. You know, all around with it, uh, and so I got caught up in it. But then I got 36 years free of it too. Yeah. So <laughs> you know, yeah. been been clean that long. So it's been real good. Yeah, and it's and it's that's you know we've talked about with the options of being a high school kid, right, or mm-hmm. going to college, right. you know, and you're a high school kid, right? With really, honestly, you really probably don't have much direction as a high school draft pick right other than what you know in high school right Back college then, it gives you a little bit we didn't have yeah college yeah. gives you a little bit of maturity yeah 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 give so, you a little bit of time away from home sometimes we grow up a little bit supposedly yeah okay right but you know yeah. th- that's the way it is ideally but um so anyway i did a lot of growing up after yeah uh, and i found out a lot of things and i became a therapist afterwards so for the last 28 years for 28 years i, I ran you know counseling offices mm-hmm. and I had my own nonprofit business, and I still have one now. We just kind of let it go down because of COVID. And uh, 
my son and I was doing some things in the community, community-based outreach, and uh, I'm still, you know, trained counselor. I'm just, my, my certification doesn't qualify in Texas. Yeah. Texas has different reciprocities and whatever, and so it's set up. So my, my equivalent is like a licensed LPC. Mm-hmm. However, it doesn't fly over here. So they wanted me to go back and go to school. I'm like, dude, I'm 58 years old. I'm not going back to school for this. I'm getting ready to retire fully. I got my pension, the whole works. I got my Social Security. I'm with home, my mm-hmm. family, the whole works. I'm fine. So I said, what I'll do instead of going back and getting my credentials, I'll find someone that I can mentor. And I can show them the ropes that I had learned as a counselor, as a you know working professional, working on codependency and anger management, interrupted behavior, interrupted behaviors, and so on and so forth. So, done that for years, and so now uh, I still do a little bit on the phone with with, with friends or people that uh, I know, but give them some direction. But I kind of miss it. Um, you know, I miss the counseling piece, that helping others because somebody helped me, mm-hmm. and I. Who yeah, helped? Promise. Who helped Ellis Valentine? Um, the Meadows Treatment Facility in Wickenburg, Arizona, and I'm gonna tell you why it helped me. Because in that town, there's only one McDonald's. It was one stoplight. I came from big Los Angeles. Yep. So I go to a treatment facility in Wickenburg, Arizona, right outside of Prescott. Yep. Okay. I've seen the signs get, for it. We go play golf. Like yeah. Wickenburg. I've, always, I've seen the sign. <laughs> I, you know, you're driving, but yeah. I never knew exactly where it was. Wonderful place. It was called the Meadows, uh, run by Pia and Pat Melody. And uh, these people are well-known in the field of codependency, which is one of the disorders that most men suffer from that most men don't want to deal with because it kind of sounds foofy. Mm -hmm. No, it's very, very serious stuff that most men do not understand. The reason why they say yes when they want to say no. Everybody does that. Who who found this place for you? Is it something Uh, that somebody... Uh, said something Doc about Doc Ellis. Okay. Yeah, Doc Ellis was my mentor. Doc had gotten sober and gotten clean. And my mom, uh, I wasn't married at the time. My mom employed him to uh, kind of bird dog me in Los Angeles, kind of kind of follow me around and get me, get, get me together, to get me ready to go and get some help. Because it wasn't that I was doing the drugs for enjoyment. I was doing the drugs just to kind of medicate some emotions, okay? Mm-hmm. And I didn't realize that until I went through the meadows and I started learning all this stuff about CD and about all this stuff about uh, chemical dependency and family dependency and all that stuff and histrionics and all that. And next thing you know, I came up with a, um, I guess, a following of people that just wanted to hire me to start working for them. And the next thing I know, I'm, I'd never had another job besides baseball. Mm-hmm. except for shining shoes when I was a kid and I did that just to play uh, pool at the pool hall okay and so the next thing you know uh, I'm playing pro ball so I did that and then I got out I had to find myself all over again so I went through this program mm-hmm. and they taught me all these things about dynamics and I started to see the Montreal Expo is different I started to see the New York Mets is different I started to see the Angels <clears throat> the Rangers everybody different uh, I started to see everything different because before I was just preparing to play professional baseball. Yep. Period. Mm-hmm. And I didn't anticipate it was going to end in 13 years, but it did. But I was fortunate enough to be financially in a position to take care of myself for the rest of my life from that. Um, it still had a pension and who works. And um, I've been doing okay. So the fun part about it is just watching now the game that I played change (laughs) it's a different game it is and so uh all those years that you know i was going through all those different changes and whatever personally uh the 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 counseling has allowed me to understand you more than myself you follow me Mm -hmm. because you know when you're growing up and you're 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 young you're a kid you don't know all these things you're really trying to find yourself so you don't have time to think about others yeah, you know, get that ego going, you know, and uh, so I started to, you know, focus and concentrate more on others than on myself, and that allowed me to get out of myself and start living, and and that's what happened. Montreal was one of the greatest cities I've ever lived in. I love that place, but it was a real difficult place to play for. 
young black ball players. As far as just the atmosphere, or are you talking about this nightlife? Well, no, no, no. It's not, I'm not saying it was racist or anything. No, I'm I mean just not saying. just being yeah. out, you know, like yeah, the partying being, and everything yeah. else that type. I, I've heard, I've heard the stories of this oh place. Is one of the, the yeah. place was, I, yeah. I mean, it was just it's like fulfilling. a Mardi Gras for, yeah, it was fulfilling. Uh, yes, that's what I've heard. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Numerous people yeah. of so, how Montreal was. So it was, it was, or it was great. And so leaving there was very traumatic. So I learned a lot when I went to the counseling programs afterwards and became a counselor and started working with families and started going through their process with them. And their process was similar to mine, so I could help them very easily because I had the inroad. <laughs> and the next thing you know, it became very successful. We did uh, quite a few uh, things in uh, California uh, very quickly with a, uh, with a charitable organization that we opened. And uh, I, I tend to do it here as well. Here, people just don't know me that way. Yeah, you know, they don't know that that's my background. They don't know how many families I've worked with. They don't know how many programs that we put together. They don't know the dynamics that we 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 introduce to others. And this was just because someone helped me. Yeah, and most people, when you know, I, you hear the stories when they check. You checked yourself into the rehab facility, correct? Yes. And then most people go, and then they don't stay long. I went to three. You went to three of them. Yeah, first two. First one I went there, I lied. <laughs> I, you know, because I was fresh out of baseball. Yeah. I couldn't go in there, hey, I'm who I am. So the next thing I know, it was Daniel Freeman Hospital in uh, the marina in California. And because um, I paid cash. And so I came out of there, and I did good for about, oh, God, 90 days. Okay, I went. I had a drive-through dairy. You know, we drive through, get your milk, cigarettes, and cookies, and whatever. And I, my dad and I was running. And so, and then one day I just bailed and told Dad run it, and I was out. And so, and I just bounced. And so, the next thing you know, I had to get myself together, man, and turn it all around. It just life is just so much was going on for me, Kev. I mean, it was just you know, I, I had to you know, L.A. was. That's another city you're in too, right? There's a lot of nightlife and everything else there too. It's it was it was tough, so I had to get out of L.A. So, like I said, I, I finally went to the Meadows program, and I left the Meadows program and went back to Los Angeles. I sold my mom's house that I was buying for her. Yeah, I told her I said we were going to start. So I gave her my house that I was buying because my dad's income, my income had changed, mm -hmm. but. My dad's income uh, could carry my family through the house that I had, which was less than the place that they had. And so, but it's still nice. Swimming pool, yeah. the whole works, you know, in Baldwin Hills, da, da, da. Right around the corner from Ray Charles, actually. So, so it wasn't too bad, but I wanted, I'd promised them a home, so mm -hmm. I gave it to them. And uh, so, and I severed everything else, and I gave all my investments to my mom, car wash, dairy, Apartment complex, all that stuff. I gave them my mom and dad. I said, "Hey, look, you guys took care of me by my mom. I'm gonna take care of you." Boom. They had income about seven, eight thousand dollars a month from these various places, and so and I went and uh, got myself together. Went back to school, went to LA Mission College, got my counseling credentials, and then I sat for my uh, national uh, counseling credentials in 1994. LA Mission College started in 1988. I retired in '85. Um, and then uh, um, I got my national credentials in 1994 because what you had to have was uh, 5,000 hours of counseling, certified counseling hours. Yeah. I had all these therapists sign me off and this, mm -hmm. that, and the other, and all these programs and got my counseling credentials. And um, so I did that for up until 2014. When I moved here to Texas, I did it for about seven years here in Texas. and then. Um, I left that, that position and haven't, you know, we just haven't pushed it anymore. So you left LA, you moved here. When did you move to Texas? 2006. Okay. Mm -hmm. So you've been here ever since though, just kind of get, getting away from all this, right. The, this, the enticements and everything else that you were around forever. That is right, just, just too congested. It's not enticing that way. Cause when, you know, people do what they do and don't care where you're at. If you're going to do it, you're yeah, going to do true. it. True. So, uh, LA is just. Too, too many people in one area. And yep. I, I, I felt crowded, you know, it just, I needed this space like mm -hmm. you have here, you know, and some room. And also this is middle America, pretty much. You can go to any coast in two and a half hours. Yeah. 
back then I used to get assignments for New York or Florida, flying from LA to Florida. That's a whole day. Yeah. So that cuts into your money. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> you know Absolutely. what I mean? So you had to start looking at, okay, well, where where it makes sense. So my wife and I started looking around and we looked at Atlanta. But we still happened to look at Atlanta during the time that right when Co- Katrina was hitting. Mm-hmm. And uh, when Katrina hit, the uh, raindrops in Atlanta was huge because it was coming. Yeah. And uh, we decided, no, I don't think we want to be here. <laughs> you know, it was just a bad weekend. But then we decided on here. My wife's from Longview. Okay. But she grew up in California. And, you know, and I got the relationship with the Rangers. And we, property taxes here, different. Everything, but not property taxes, but property values, different. Housing market, different. So whole works. So moving from L.A. to here was a no-brainer. Been here ever since, loving it and just being a part of just helping out in the community. You said people don't know the Ellis Valentine that has helped change people, right? Like no, you said, they know the Ellis Valentine, the ball player. Yes, but they don't know the Ellis Valentine. Exa- exactly, exactly. Right. You know that's I know baseball's you know starting to they have the base that baseball assistance team, the bat program. Um, Cameron Lowe just actually took over the uh, the minor. I can't think what it's called. The ace. Not sure exactly, but the one that Dick Beveridge used to run for the minor league program, okay. um, Cameron Lowe just took it over as far as the president of it, helping mm. that you know helping the minor what league ball player. They help out as far financially. They help out guys that have. I remember um, Jason Hart played here with the Rangers in the minor leagues. He was dealing with some head tra- some head issues as far as uh, I want to say it was a t- maybe a tumor. I'm not sure, mm. but they were able to financially help him out where they, you know, you put it the money for the, to be able to help him with some, some bills because minor so, league salary mm. and it helps out the minor league side of it. It's almost kind of, kind of like a union type of deal with them, but how it's set up guys put into it. Um, oh, and it's just the association. Uh, it's the association of professional ball players. I think in general is how it's set up. Okay. Okay. So that might be something where that program talk reaching out to Cameron just saying, Hey, to be able to help help out. I mean, going to uh, you know, Jeff Hickson that runs mm-hmm. the, the alumni mm-hmm. side of it is uh, you know, the, the to be able to talk to and then uh, Jim Tomey now is our president. Is oh, yeah. a player's alumni president. Now he took over for Brooks. So I think he's on that board. Uh, I'm gonna say Greg Maddox might be on there. There's a couple of other guys, so guys that you would know mm-hmm. of where we can help get Ellis Valentine beyond what he, if, if that's, I mean, if you're wanting to get back in, cause that, that's the biggest thing, you know, especially mental health, drugs, everything else nowadays, because nobody wants to ask for help, right? Everybody's afraid to say something True. until you've been down that road. Right. right. We've talked about of saying, yeah, I'm sure you can walk into a room and tell somebody that's having problems, right? Because you've been down that road of just saying, well, the, I've been trained in family dynamics, not just in substance yeah. abuse or addiction. And my certification is in, is in uh, behavioral addictions. Yeah. Behavioral addictions. So these are things that we do yeah. all the time that become problematic. It's not what we say. It's what we're doing. It causes a problem. And a lot of folks can't stop doing what they're doing because they don't know what encouraged them. Because they don't really know emotions. See, most guys don't know this. Yeah. Uh, guys don't learn about emotions. I had to learn about emotions because it was a mess. We suppress them. Yeah. Well, we run from them because that's not macho. Yeah. Okay, and it's still the machismo thing, da, da, da. But see, I've been able to help a lot of guys because, you know, they see me and they say, well, hey, he's a, it's, it's a way to do it. It's a way to go about it and still keep your manhood mm-hmm. and still keep your manliness. But the bottom line is guys don't want to talk about feelings. They don't want to do it. But they sit there and the feelings running, that's what's running your life. Yeah. But you can't control it because you don't know it. You see what I mean? So that's why the guys that I work with, it helps them to transition faster because we don't operate by what we think. We operate by what, by what we feel. Try to connect this 18 inches. It's the hardest 18 inches to connect your head and your heart at the same time. Can't do it. You can turn your head off. Try turning your heart off. Can't do it. You guys got to learn that because that's where most of our problems come in because of the resistance. So uh, that's what changed my life. People look at me now, and they, a lot of folks was betting on me years ago that I wasn't gonna make it. <laughs> you know. And here you are, right? Yeah, I'm still here. Yeah. I mean, especially, I mean, from where you, like you said, where you grew up, what you've been through and everything else, yeah. it just... It, it, most of it has been 
word of mouth of what people have heard about me more so than them knowing me. They don't know me. It's just been what they've heard, what they've been told. And now they look at me and they go, wow, that's not even him at all. But because they had this preconceived notion of that. Yeah, it is. Valentine. He's a, he's a baseball player. Yeah, yeah, and right? he had this and he did that and he did whatever. But they didn't find out about the other stuff. Yeah, See? and I didn't know about that until I was there was something on Facebook, somebody about a book that was written about mm-hmm. you. You were you had mentioned I think something on Facebook. A guy had written a, talking about your arm, mm-hmm. but he had written it in a book. I don't remember what Jeff, it was. Jeff Perlman was that what it was, was the Perlman? guy that yeah he did uh, the launch pad in Sports Illustrated. Okay, um, and uh, they was going around talking about Ruben Sierra. I think it mm-hmm. was was the guy with Texas. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, he had a good arm. Da da da. And it was comparing. You know him to others, and he, he said they kept going to places, and people kept coming up with my name. It's in the it's a, it's in a Sports Illustrated magazine that's called the Launch Pad. It's an article, and Jeff's just doing a, a, a story on Bo Jackson right now. Yeah, I saw that. Yeah, and, and Jeff and I are pretty close, but you know, because he, he just <laughs> I like him. He's he's feisty. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. For, yeah. I've heard. Yeah. yeah. We've had conversations. He's a yeah. Del, he's a he's a Delaware product. That's oh, where yeah. I went to school. So I've oh, talked yeah. to Jeff numerous times. Oh yeah. But yeah, I've, I saw that. I wasn't sure. It, yeah, I see that the the story of Bo's coming out right now. And he, mm-hmm. I think somebody they had put some a scout had put in there. It was the only I guess they had written in the chart about him is mm-hmm. this guy can hit it 400 feet. He can run over there, catch it, throw it back, <laughs> and then come all the way back. He's the only of, yeah. of seeing the the talent that that Bo had and what, and what he's able to do. Unbelievable. Um, but hearing that, you know, it had been impressive to sit there and watch, to hear, like I said, hear the stories about you and, and, and the arm strength, what you were cap- capable of doing. Yet you didn't pitch. Right? No, in Texas, the Rangers tried to be in the bullpen. I was there with Tom House. He was warming me up in the bullpen. And when I went to the, the Angels, they did the same thing uh, because m- my arm was still good. My mm-hmm. legs just was terrible. And, you know, pitching, you got to keep your legs under you. But I had a nasty little slider. And damn good breaking ball, and uh, I had a changeup. So had a lot of different pitches, and the thing was, a lot of guys come to me for pitching afterwards. Uh, when as you know now, mm-hmm. because of throwing mechanics, yeah, not because of pitching, but throwing mechanics, and you know pitching today, uh, it's kind of like um, guys are looking at this as a badge of honor. Uh, if they pitch like Tommy John, no, Tommy John ruined his arm doing that, <laughs> yep. pitching that way. So you guys are getting this Tommy John surgery. That's not the happiest thing in the world. I mean, it does help some guys, but you know, it's just, baseball is just different. And it's, it, I love the game so much, but uh, even like now, I watched the first game of the World Series. There was no defense. There was no plays made. It was just home runs, strikeouts. <laughs> And that it is the game is changing for from like you said from how we watched it this small ball you played National League baseball right you yes you had the pitchers hitting you know and and doing that stuff having learning to you, you knew they were if you were hitting seventh eighth in the lineup they wanted to pitch to you or the or because they didn't they'd much rather have the pitcher leading off as opposed to True. right so they were trying to figure it out and then, and now it's just everybody goes up there and You're just hanging yeah. And saying, like, you know, and, and, and the thing is, too, is they're not playing as a team, but they're still playing. I mean, I don't dislike the game. The game is just different, okay? I don't dislike it. But if you were hitting behind me and there was a guy on second base and there was nobody out and we needed to run and we need to get that guy to third, my job is getting third for you to drive him in. So that helps your RBI status. They, you know what I'm saying? I'm, I'm work, I sacrifice myself for you. I've Some guys will do that for me, too. That's the way I was brought up playing. When I see a guy go up there now, and, and you got a man on second base with two out, nobody out, and he swings the first pitch and grounds out to, th- to the third baseman, and then he walks back to the dugout and he doesn't get any crap. Yeah, the on deck hitter should be one second. All you had to do, is, you know, as a hitter, they're going to pitch you in, right? As yeah. So figure out a way to, if you need to drop a, a bunt down on that side, but figure it out. You know they're going to pitch you in. So, and that's the thing. I don't think there's no. Mindset. Yeah. The mindset of the game today is different from our mindset when we play. So they're, they're reactive. I'm, we were I'm, proactive in I'm, knowing. I'm, 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 I'm kind of, at, at certain times, I'm kind of perplexed with what goes on. 
Yeah, because I mean, it, and how did you learn that though? By you watched the game happen. You were there at the top top of the dugout watching the game. Hey, what needs to be done here? As opposed to you know now they're looking at their computers and everything else. They're not they're not engaged in the game with no. knowing right. They're planning. Hey, what needs to be done here? I'm watching. If I get this opportunity, do I need to bunt them over? Is this going to be this or that? And it, yeah, because it was know, a team sport then. It's not a team sport anymore. And that's the scary part. But, you know, I hope it gets back to that in some degree. But they said they don't even take infield practice anymore. So, you know, the other team doesn't know what the outfielder's arms look like. The outfielders, don't, you don't know what your outfielder's arms look like because he hasn't thrown, da, da, da. So, you know, there's so many different aspects of the game today that, you know, I've had to accept, you know, because, you know, I go there looking for a certain thing, and it's just not there anymore. And it's tough, though, right, because you, you're so used to it being – how your how the game was played, right? Of, well, of being, that's how we were taught. Yeah, to play the game. I mean, you know, you, you play ABC baseball, and that's it. Uh, if I'm an outfielder, my job is I'm the second line of defense. <clears throat> I'm the last guy out there, so I got to be smart out here. I can't just be out here just taking up space. But I don't see a whole lot of defensive outfielder play uh, anymore. I see a lot of diving. I never dove for a ball in my entire career, and I was a Gold Glove outfielder and All Star. These guys dive because it looked good on CNN. They, yep. uh, uh, they play know. it into a dive. Yeah, right. ESN, they don't. Uh, ESPN, whatever. Yeah, you know it looks good. Yeah, going to the day. remember remember the Kevin Mitchell barehanded catch, right? Going down, <laughs> yeah, I remember right? that. Going to go go those days, guys running, you know, into the wall and, and doing anything else. They play it. They play it that way, right? There's no. It's like you said. There's no. There's no pro thought going into it. I mean, it's... So that's the difference about the game now, which makes it really hard for us, former guys like you know myself and others, to get involved with the game because the way we were taught to play the game is not the way the game is being played today. So our input is not necessary. Yeah. That's, why, that's, not, that's why a lot of <coughs> former guys are not around, Kev, and you know that. Yeah. Uh, it hurts us because a lot of these guys need to work. Yeah. yeah. And you see, there, there are still some of those old school managers. You know, they brought Bochy well, in here. Well, I thought they brought Bochy. Yeah. Bochy. What are here. they going to let him do? Let's see that's what the thing. They, I think, uh, you know, with Chris, Chris Young being there and then being playing, to, you know, with he was in San Diego being around, that – Chris, I think, understands it, too, that even a lot of people are saying the numbers, the analytics are destroying the game of baseball. You've just got to get down to the nitty-gritty of, one, accountability, right? You screw up, somebody in that clubhouse is going to jump your backside, right? And I think and they, the respect, and then, two, these managers that have played understand what guys go through knowing, mm -hmm. when, hey, you something happens, Ellis, you handle it, right? The guys understand that that's part of your job is to do that, not – Right, because what do they do? They they go in, they go and they go sit in their locker. They look at all their Facebook, Twitter, whatever followers and everything right. else. They they don't interact. They don't they don't do this. I mean, heck, even going to the game now, it's it's almost as if you're going uh, talking through plate glass. Hey, I'm gonna autograph. When you gotta walk down here and this and that, right? There's just no, there's none of this anymore. There's no. no and, and and it's tough because that's what it's that's what it's about. It's about the interaction. You're there. It's you're a group. You're a family. We've as far as the team and everybody else, but sometimes it's it's a bunch of individuals now, and that, like I said, I don't, there aren't those guys there to pull pull the reins and go, whoa, time out here. Well, and that comes from the top down. Yep. Okay, and that I, that has to change from there uh, to make this change down here. So the requirement is that the outfielders, I I I, I listen to or all the stuff that's going on with the outfielders and all that stuff, but. The outfielders nowadays are not required to play the outfield. They're not. I mean, you know, I saw balls hitting the base of the fence. No ball is supposed to hit the base of a fence. Where are you playing, for, you know, for that to happen? And especially these porches are shorter, the fields are shorter, the balls are flying out of the ballpark like crazy, so why are you playing shallow? It, <laughs> you know? It, it is. You're, you're, and I don't know where it starts, but you hope it starts with the manager and the front office. Be, but the problem is sometimes they bring these managers in to be a, almost a puppet. To, as a well, puppet. it's not it's a Not really a puppet, but you, you know, know what I, mean, I, 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 yeah. I feel what you're yeah. saying. They bring them in and, and, and their, their abilities are limited. Yeah. Put it that way. We need to get these guys to uh, recognize, hey, look, you know, let's put some numbers together as a team more than individual uh, numbers. I mean, back in the day, uh, three-something, four-something ERAs was unheard of. You weren't doing very well. Yeah. 
you know, nowadays it's acceptable. Come on. You're saying it's mediocre and it's, it's okay? No, it's not. I, I believe that the Rangers are on the right track right now because we're indoors. You know, it's hard playing in this heat. Yeah. <laughs> yeah I, I, it, it's tough for me to mow my grass in this heat. Yeah. <laughs> you know, oh, yeah. so these guys got to go out there in these uniforms and play. It's pretty bad. So by, set, by July, by All-Star break, our pitchers are burnt. Yeah. They're fried. I mean, you can't. I mean, your body only got so much elasticity, man. I mean, you, you burn out after a while. What do you think about it? It's it, it's going to get to the point where you're, you're running a seven-man rotation. Guys are – starters are going to go three, four innings, right? They weren't taught mm-hmm. like you were. What are you talking about? Your arm's just a mechanism, right? You use your body to throw. Mm-hmm. Use your legs to throw. They're not taught that, right? No. So they're going out and, right, the 50 pitches. All right, you're done for the night. Here comes our fourth inning guy, our fifth inning guy. Right. Now, as opposed to seven, eight, nine innings, yeah, there's a few that are out there, but for the most part, they're becoming obsolete, right? It is. It is, and, and you know, and they, they, that's the way they're contractually set up, you know, to do it that way. And, and so just the demand is different. And so that's hard for us to accept. Now, you know, they're going to throw it on us, but nothing we can do about it. It's hard for us to accept because I want to go there and I want to see a game. I want to see some strategy coming. I want to I wanna see y'all beat some folks. What but, do you mean? You're not turned on by a team <laughs> batting average about 220 when the highest guy's hitting 246? And, and it's it, – they're throwing – guys are throwing harder, but they're teaching longer swings to get to it, right? This yeah. all – they they can't teach someone to hit like Ellis Valentine if they're only 5'5", five, five, mm-hmm. right? They can't do that. You know, that's what it – and it's, in, it's the individual. Yeah, that's what Bochy said the other day, right? Yeah. Yeah, Bochy said the same thing. I can't teach everybody launch angle because everybody doesn't have that. Yeah. You know what I mean? And exit velocity stuff, they everybody don't have that kind of power. So I can't teach my entire lineup that. But yeah. that's what it's about nowadays. So you try to get as many guys that do that, and I don't know, you just lose some of the other aspects of the game, but that's okay. I mean, baseball is still fun to watch. I mean, you know, in terms of the athleticism and, the, you know, the home runs, the swings, the, the pitchers. I mean, all this stuff, watching the athleticism of it, I love it. But the game is different, and that's just something that we all have to come to grips with. You talk to the fans about it, and they just – they're like, it's – its they don't it, – They hurt. Yeah. They hurt over it. But what can they do? I mean, you know, this – Well, I don't know. They can do like they did in Oakland. They didn't even show up. Oh, boy. I know. Now, here, now that Manfred's wow. thinking they're going to end up in Vegas. Wow. You know, hey, it's, it's, it's bad, man. I mean, Oakland. <laughs> But know. but you're right. Finally, I mean, maybe that's what we need more of. The fans finally taking a stand and going, we've had enough of this. You keep, right, well, with yeah, it, yeah, the purity of whatever it is, even baseball itself, right? I mean, Oakland's, a, I mean, the city's great. You know, you're out there. The weather's beautiful, mm-hmm. right, during, especially during the day. Dang it. But you don't want people there. It's just a matter. You feel bad for that fan base, right, because yeah. they've, you know, they've. They've been loyal yes. the whole time. I mean, Cowboy fans, even like with Cowboy fans, people get on time. Hi, oh, you Cowboy fan. You know what? Cowboy fans are Cowboy fans. And they're going to be Cowboy fans regardless of what the Cowboys do. That's just it. I saw guys getting in arguments the other day, and I was just laughing at them. But, you know, a fan is a very important person. Mm-hmm. And when they show up to the ballpark, they um, they need to be recognized. You know, and so, you know, we were always friendly to them. I never played those kinds of games. And, you know, I'm too good to sign an autograph or whatever, but... You know, it just you know the the the, the game. I still love it. I I love going to the new stadium. The new stadium is gorgeous, um, but you know it's just a different game on the field. Uh, it's hard. I mean, it's it's. I think it's you know it's bad when you know the the um, the Mariners uh, Astros game. It goes eighteen innings and there's what six five six hits. I mean, it's bad if you if you can turn off the TV and miss nine innings of ten innings of baseball and see not miss much except. 30 strikeouts yeah. and turn it on and start here and watch another baseball game. So, and I think that's the most frustrating part for fans because like you said, you want to see uh, the little stuff, right? Getting guys over, you know, two strike approach flop, right. you know, it's, it's, a changed. little flare over second base is driving in runs as opposed to like that, that game could have been over in, in, in Seattle if they just think a little bit smaller than what they're doing. Right. Mm. But I mean, the men, we talked, the Mendoza line is going to be the cold standard for hitting here soon. Isn't that amazing? That's it's amazing. Yeah. I mean, there's guys that have never had, um, never been hit in the face, never had any problems with hitting, and they're hitting 200, and that's acceptable. 
Really? Yeah. Okay. So it's it's just. It's just the way it is, and so I just kind of watch uh, what's going on now, and just um, I, I, I'm, I'm encouraged by Bolchi being around uh, because I, I know Bruce from back in the day, and he's he's a good guy, he's a good dude, and uh, he's he's had to learn both the analytics part and the old school, and he's had to balance it just like Dusty said to do, and all this. So these guys, you know, they they just they just make baseball sense. You know, and so uh, give him the chance to do his thing here this year. Um, that's going to be awesome to see, awesome to watch. Yeah, I mean that's that's what it is. I think I, I just want to see. You it. just don't, you know, you don't just don't like seeing a lot of turnover. I know they, you know, they through the pitching side they went they got rid of a bunch of coaches on the pitching side through the minor league. So it'll be interesting to see what they, you know, what he brings or what they allow him to bring in. You know how they're going to do it because that's that's the biggest thing is developing those arms of doing and, and uh, then making sure that they're sustainable for that for that, that long run of what they're doing, right? And if you notice that most of these games have been lost by outfield play. Yeah. Or lack of, or balls getting through, shouldn't got through, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, extra base hits. I, I, that, that's, that's losing a ton of games. I don't know why they haven't really considered doing some more work on these outfielders and asking, having them, uh, have a requirement for them to do more. Because right now they're just going out there taking up space. I'm sorry, I killing the grass, killing the grass. Well, I, I want to see a guy make a decent throw. Yeah. Okay. Don't give me a throw where you're running, and when you throw, both feet are off the ground, and you can't, you have no control over yourself, and you're falling down. Come on, you got to collect yourself, get yourself stabilized, and make a good solid throw. Now that ball, that velocity is going to make up for the time that you did to position yourself to do it right. If they don't position themselves right, they just started to throw. Right. And I just sit and I sit there and I go. If I was a pitcher, I would be really not happy. No cutoff man. They're air mailing stuff. Yeah. I mean, I would really when when I made throws. If there was a cutoff man, he would duck. Yeah. <laughs> because I'm in line. Because yeah. he lined me up. Yeah. You see what I mean? So that's where each player plays a part where they're a teammate and they play together. And I just don't see that happening anymore. And I'd like to see more of it. But it's got to start in the minor league. Yeah, and that's the thing. We just got to see where, where, where that's going to go. But well, it's, that, it's a minor I mean, league. Heck, even start. You see it at the youth level now too, right? That kind of stuff. Throwing air mail and guys. Throw, guys, are, the cutoff man is there for a reason. Figure out well, how what what you need to do. Throw right at his head. Now, I mean, it's doing that. And you're just giving guys extra bases. But you're right. Well, they don't work. work. Remember, you would do it in spring training, right? You'd have they'd have the net. You're sitting there. Throwing. We had to work at. Yeah, it. yeah. And seeing even now. You know, when you look at uh, what positions are open, outfield positions are open. You know, everybody wants to play the infield. There's little leaguers and high school ballers and all that stuff. Everybody's playing outfield or pitching. Yep. I mean, infield or pitching. Some guy came to me and said, I, I'm just a PO. And I said, what's a PO? Parole officer. <laughs> <laughs> I thought he said he was pissed off. Yeah. <laughs> That's when I first saw yeah. too. I'm like, what? I go, what is this? Yeah. Pitcher only? Yeah. Really? So if Montreal had came to me and said, well, you're only a pitcher. You can't play right field. You can't play anywhere else. If you can't play right field, you got to go home. You're going to sit there and tell them, no, I'm a pitcher only. Uh-uh. No. So they put me in right field. I ended up playing right field. They drafted me as a pitcher. So, you know, I don't get this where you're one-dimensional. You know, these kids that come up and they're one, I only do this. Well, okay. Yeah. Nice knowing you, son. Because <laughs> I need a shortstop right now. Yeah, they're almost specialized, at, right? At, at twelve, you're a second man. And that's it. That's yeah. it. Not hey, I, I, like I said. You and I still go out and we still do our thing. Because I know you love working with folks. I see you out there. You're passionate about it, and uh, we still go out there and do our things. But all this stuff's different, and you know we got to incorporate that in with everything else that's going on in the world. So uh, baseball has been a uh, um, uh, very positive world. You know, for me, for for uh, for the years I played, but really my passion has been what I've been doing afterwards, the community work and uh, the uh, codependency work and the family stuff. Um, that's where most of the passion comes in. Right now, I'm working on a program where I'm getting ready to teach some kids how to weld. Welding is a uh, is a uh, is a good money maker for a lot of guys, and if you could teach them how to do it mobily and um, just give them some. I want to give them some leg up so they can feed themselves. Yeah, 
you know, a lot of guys are coming out, having problems, can't do this, can't do that, not employable. But when they come through church and they find a way, you know, to get on one of our crews and do some things, we'll work it out. But, how, how can people find find that, have, find reach you? And well, you can reach me at raf, uh, rafrecovery.com uh, is the name of my charity. And RAF stands for Recovering Adults and Family Treatment. Uh, and recovery means not just recovering from, you know, yeah. from chemicals. It means recovering from anything. Traumatic. We all go through traumatic stuff daily in our lives, annually. But we don't treat them as a traumatic injury. Yep. And it is a traumatic injury. We just try to go on. No, you got to process that. And you got to manage it. And yep. you got to understand it. And then you can go on. But if you don't, your emotions is going to cover and, and just control you. And a lot of people don't know how to control them. So now they're out of control. So that's what we teach. Gotcha. Raftrecovery.com? Yes. Perfect. Like I said, it looks, you know, that that's the biggest thing. Sometimes we, we always think that... We're going to change the world by, like you thought, baseball part of it. But we, you missed the, the boat until you got out and realized that that's not why I was playing baseball. I was playing baseball to help the next generation for what, what, you know, what they are going to go through and be able to help them that way. And that's the thing, right? We just – and you're having fun doing it. That's the best part, right? That's what – you wake up every day knowing it's how can great. I help someone. Yeah. Baseball has been a very welcoming tool to, to help others. Yep. I use to help others. I'll give you a story real quick. I went through, uh, went to uh, Hawaii just recently for a vacation, my wife and I. So we're coming back. We're sitting in the airport, and this kid was sitting there next to his mom, and they had their luggage and this and the other, and they had on the Chicago Cubs hat, right? And he's sitting across from us in, in, in our, on our aisle, and his sister, uh, he was, what, nine? His sister came up. She's, what, 10, you know, 11 or whatever, a year or two older, I think. And she was being nasty to him. I mean, ugly. And uh, so the little young boy, you know, you could see he was kind of dejected from it. And then he got up and he went and sat over in the other aisle because the sister wanted to sit next to the mother. Mm -hmm. And he was sitting next to her. So he made her move. Made he, she made him move. And he got up and he was upset. So what happened? I went over and I, after a while, I went over and I, because he was over there all by himself and pouting the whole works. And I said, um, Cub fan, huh? Yeah. And he smiled. And um, his mom looked over at us, and I was talking to her, and she was like, what's going on over there? So I said, I used to play for the Montreal Expos. We used to play against the Cubs. And he said, really? So I pulled out my phone, and I showed him my picture. He lit up. He was crying. He was upset for what had happened over there. So I said, what's going to do? I'm going to send you a picture. When I get when I get back to Texas, I'm gonna send you uh, a photo, okay? Uh, sign it to you and the whole works for your for your son. Don't tell him. I told the mother. I said, don't tell him. And it pulled him out of that craziness. But what happened? The sister overheard me talking to him when you know mm -hmm. I was talking with him, and she got all bent out of shape because her actions is the ones that caused all this in the first yep. place. And see what baseball did. I was able to give this kid a baseball, an autographed baseball. I mailed it to him. I shipped it to him. Autographed baseball, a picture, and the whole works. And, you know, uh, cards and the whole works. He had it framed, and they sent me back a picture. I'll just have to show it to yeah. you one day. You can show it on your show. But baseball does little things like that, you know, where you, this is not about me being uh, all that. This is about me giving – a little diversion to a little child through something that he could benefit from. And that was, that was pretty awesome. You know, uh, that, that it could rechannel him that day. It was pretty seeing the smile on his face. So now right. I got a friend for life. There you go. Yeah. Exactly. I mean, that's, what, that's what we do. And I know you've had stories like that. Absolutely. Right. You just try you, you change the direction where they, where their focus is. Well, it's a redirection. Yeah, yeah, yeah. you're right. You know, it's just, just don't stay there. Move, move to another place. Yeah. And so, you know, what he found out at that time is that, you know, just there's always hope. I just want to there's always hope for better. You don't have to put up with all that craziness all the time. Because this little sister was a, she was a, she was a little busy thing. Oh, I'm sure. <laughs> but I, it, it was nice to, uh, his name is Lofton. It was, it was nice to, uh, to uh, do that for him. 
That's perfect. Like you said, that that's I think that's our goal as athletes. Just we we can't change the world. We change one person. You put a smile on someone's face that day. You've you've done your job because you never know what happened in ten years when that little boy turns into a man. And hey, I remember this time I was on a plane and I met Els Valentine. He you know changed you know helped me whatever. We don't know you know no, how no, far no. our reach is. So and that's all it is. It's just a matter of just being who we are. I always tell people. The fans aren't here for us. We're no. here for the fans. Exactly. That's what it's about. We're, that's our job is, is to not the other way around. So no. if we wouldn't have this great game if it wasn't for them. I did that to Gary Owens and didn't know it was Gary Owens in New York. He, he was sitting there, little boy, over the stadium, over the, uh, the dugout. I came in after the, end of, the inning was over, and I threw him a baseball. So the next inning, came in, threw him another one. <laughs> He remembered it. He mentioned it on a on a podcast. Did he? Yeah, and a friend of mine called me and told me that uh, that he had said that, and he, he shot me the link, and I saw it, and I was like, wow. That was, goes way back to 81. There you go. That's what I mean. You never know what yeah. that what that's done for him. And now for, he's famous. Yeah. There <laughs> you, you know, go. So because all, all because of your baseball. Well, else. just because of baseball. Yeah. Just because of baseball. I mean, you know, you know what it does to kids. Mm -hmm. You know what it does for people. I mean, you and I are out there on Miracle League. Yeah. You know what it does. So it's a it's a fun thing. I mean, you know, you and I have something to talk about for the rest of our life. Yeah, exactly. You know, and, and some things to do. And helping people out. That's that's what it's about. And having I, fun. I need doing to help it. you with your, your your stuff with the the vets. Yeah. Yeah, the, uh, the the MVP, the emerging vets with uh, emerging vets and players, the guys dealing with like you talked about the identity. I had Denver on uh, a couple weeks ago. Stuff. Yes, exactly, and helping out. Just I need direction. I don't know what to do, and I think that's that's part of yeah. everybody has a little niche in it. But we're all trying to get to one main goal. We got nine players on the team. Everybody doesn't hit a home run. Mm -hmm. Somebody hits singles. Yep, exactly. You know what I mean? But so, we're all paddling in the same direction. Exactly. So yeah, just don't, I just, just let me play. So, well, I appreciate you coming on here today. I was telling your story and how, like I said, hopefully we can continue to, uh, to build this and reach out to players, um, uh, even athletes that are not an athlete, right? Anything, anybody that needs help, right? Cause sometimes people don't want to ask, like you said, some people are too prideful to do it. Well, and I do the other thing too, I got the background and the credentialing. And yeah. That's what I mean. So you've been in, the, you've been I've in it. Been so you, in it. So I, you can tell people yeah. how to, they didn't just I know what to it. say. He's a former ball player. You talk to him, but I don't know anything about the subject, Yeah, you know, but I do. Yeah. And that's what's helped. Um, I'm, I'm leaving here and they got a, got a session about, about three 30 today. Um, just me with a guy and we work, working through some things because men need it. Mm -hmm. We do need it. Um, a lot of men are struggling right now because there's a lot of confusion. But we don't have to be so tough. No, it's that fellowship that you can create, yeah. right? Just like you said, just, sometimes all you got to do is sit down and just listen. That, that's it. You know, um, make that thing happen. Um, I'm a good listener. And that's why, you know, uh, the counseling piece works for me because I get fulfillment out of it. Yeah. When I know that I've given this guy a nugget or a tool or something that's going to stop him from doing some of the problematic behaviors that he's been doing for years, you know, we used to call it, you know, habits, okay, back in the day. <clears throat> some people have good habits, you know, good habits, you brush your teeth every morning, but then there's some bad ones. You know, we got to find out the bad ones, we got to get rid of them. So that's what I've been doing. It's been great, Kev. I thank you for having me on the show. Absolutely. Man. Like I said, hopefully yeah. we've changed somebody's life that's listening. And uh, like I said, you guys can find Ellis at raftrecovery.com. Yeah, correct. R-A-F-T. Recovery.com recovery. and be able to help out. And uh, like I said, see what he's got in store for the future. Like I said, anybody that you know that's struggling with anything, reach out. Mm -hmm. Feel free. I mean, Ellis is, is right here. In uh, in Texas, if you're out of state, whatnot, it doesn't matter. Whatever he's got a way, they've got a way. So if if not, he'll find a way. So we appreciate everybody for listening today, and uh, we'll see you guys again later.